ಬರ್ಹಾಪೀಡಂ ನಟವರವಪೂ ಕರ್ಣಯೋ ಕರ್ಣಿಕಾರ ಬೀಭ್ರದ್ವಾಸ ಕನಕಕಪಿಶಂ ವೈಜಯಂತಿ ಮಾಲಾನ್ವೇನೋ ರಧರಸುಧಯ ಪೂರೆಯನ್ ಗೋಪವೃಂದೇ ವೃಂದಾರಣ್ಯ ಸ್ವಪದರಮನ ಪ್ರಾವಿಶದ್ಗೀತಕೀರ್ತಿ ಶ್ರೀ ಸ್ವಾಮಿಯಾಣ ಭಗವಾನ್ ನೀಜೆ ಅಕ್ಷರ ಪುರುಷೋತ್ತಮ ಮಹಾರಾಜ ನೀಜೆ ರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ದೇವ ನೀಜೆ ಸಿಯಾವರ ರಾಮಚಂದ್ರ ಭಗವಾನ್ ನೀಜೆ ಉಮಾಪತಿ ಮಹಾದೇವ ನೀಜೆ ಪ್ರಮುಖ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಮಹಾರಾಜ ನೀಜೆ ಮಹಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಮಹಾರಾಜ ನೀಜೆ ಲಂಡನ್ ಮಂದಿರ್ ರಜತ್ ಜಯಂತಿ ಮಹೋತ್ಸವ ನೀ ಜೈ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಜೈ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನಾರಾಯಣ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ಅನದರ್ ಎಡಿಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೈಮ್ಲೆಸ್ ಹಿಂದೂ ವಿಸ್ಡಮ್ ಇನ್ ಅವರ್ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಎಪಿಸೋಡ್ ವಿ ವರ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ಡ್ ಟು ದ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತ್ ಪುರಾನ್ ರಿಟನ್ ಬೈ ವ್ಯಾಸ್ ಜಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಕ್ಲೈಮ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ that shastra is that it describes shri krishna bhagwan's life in the 10th skand within which the 21st chapter is venu geet the song of krishna's flute we started an extended personification of the flute and at english school at school when we're studying in english we learned that a personification is a literary term that means we're attributing human traits to something inanimate or an animal that's not a human now it's debatable that although a bamboo plant is a living being it nor the flute can experience feelings to the same level that a human can this is true the point of this comparison is not to undermine human emotions and experiences but the hindu shastras seek to make us more receptive and sensitive to the simple things of life so we become mindful enough to take notice of the ordinary things all around us that have the potential to bring out the extraordinary things within us so the simple things of life help us comprehend the complex things of life and provide us with new perspective on how to live our life in a more compassionate comprehensive and complete manner and that's how we end up with such extended comparisons which are actually rooted in compassion and deep spirituality so it's not mere symbolism but the symbolism is a result of profound spirituality the symbolism that easily catches our eye is just the tip of the iceberg though it's just the first thing we notice but if we dive a little deeper only then do we realize the vast majority of the iceberg is hidden deep within out of sight to those only looking at things superficially just gliding over the surface so this symbolism in the shastras is capable of revealing deep spiritual life changing messages to anyone sincerely searching for answers to life's troubling problems the word symbol is another word for icon and we know a lot about icons we're always clicking them on our phones so the symbolism in the shastras is like clicking on an icon on your phone the icon seems very simple but one click on it and magic starts all of a sudden in an instant you're taken to a place that provides you with tons of information and thousands of options a simple tiny icon can open up to you a whole new world of experience just as the understanding of the symbolism of the shastras can lead you to the true pot of gold of profound spirituality that can be found within our shastras with that said let's click on our icon of krishna's 
flute. In our previous session, we had embarked on a journey of the bamboo beginning the process of becoming the flute. We left off with a bamboo taken by the craftsman to be transformed into the flute from the Venu Geet and the Srimad Bhagwat Puran and a Gujarati poem that we were looking through. We were looking at the answers that are provided to the gopis for their question as to why the flute is so dear to Sri Krishna Bhagwan. In our previous session, we learned to develop fortitude by seeing tolerance in a positive light and figuring out the list of things that are out of our control. We can't control the weather, we can't control other people, we can't force our family members to change and always treat us with respect. And we can't control how people feel about us and the decisions that other people make as well for their own lives. Fortitude is strengthening our tolerance muscles by knowing what is out of our control and focusing on what we can influence. We looked at this much regarding fortitude and now we will turn our focus to another aspect of tolerance that is flexibility. The third line of the poem introduces this concept and it goes Achanak ek dine to karigar ne haathe aavi Angaravindhana ena sarane chade Vagya pela vasalari ne vindha vupare the poem says, Achanak, unexpectedly, Ek din karigar ne hathe avi. One day a craftsman takes hold of the bamboo. Ena angada vindhana. The bamboo is cut, sliced, carved open, poked at, hollowed out, sara ne chade, and then tied down onto a lathe machine and spun silly till the point of becoming dizzy. In life, unexpected things happen. And these unexpected events can lead us to feeling a tad bit lost. The bamboo didn't expect what was about to take place. The flute didn't expect the process, but it did learn to accept the process. Just like we didn't expect this pandemic, along with many other random things that happen in our life, Anywhere from something as colossal as COVID-19 or something as small as someone deciding to social distance themselves from us on social media. For some, that can be as tragic as a pandemic. That's beside the point. But regardless of our current threshold for tolerance, the flute is asking each and every one of us, how will you deal with the unexpected? Man Swami Maharaj, our Guru and the Guru of BAPS, was asked, how is it that even in a situation where anyone else would get angry, you can manage to stay calm? He answered very casually by saying, I've never allowed my mind to become fixated even on what will happen one second from now. The trick is to realize the random events that happen, the unexpected events that happen, that take place day in and day out, are not as random as we think. We, as the flute, don't know what's in store for us, but the craftsman has a plan in mind. The craftsman carefully carves, sands, and polishes us, and then graciously delivers us into the hands of the musician. Similarly, our Guru carefully changes us and then gently delivers us into the hands of God. We've been looking at the story of the flute, which is within the chapter specifically named Venu Geet, the song of the flute, not the self-pity of the flute or not the complaint of the flute. If an amateur takes hold of an instrument and tries playing it for the first time, it can sometimes sound like the instrument is complaining, 
They may be yelling, help, help, someone, anyone, please save me from this individual. But when the same instrument is in the hands of a seasoned master, it's a much more pleasant experience for the instrument as well as the listener. And then the instrument and the listener and even the musician can continue playing and listening for hours. So flexibility is also learning to enjoy the unexpected. Flexibility is adjusting happily to the unexpected. A first glance at a wooden flute makes it apparent that the flute is hollow and its insides are exposed by the various holes. The flute is completely open. This aspect of the flute conveys to us the subtle spiritual message that we need to become completely open in front of God and our Guru. So, when we approach God and the Guru, we shouldn't harbor any hidden agenda, motives, any arrogance or preconceived notions. We need to be completely straightforward and open. And when in the hands of Sri Krishna Bhagwan, the flute is open to any tune Krishna wants to play. The flute is ready to sing the song that Krishna fills into it. This is the flexibility of the flute. The flute has never decided, I will only play this tune or I will only play that song. My guru, who initiated me into the sadhu fold, the same person who built the BAPS Hindu Mandir here in Nisden, London, Pramukh Swami Maharaj, there is a devotional song written about him in which a devotee is praying to Pramukh Swami Maharaj that says, Mari Muralia Esura Gute Jesur Tamane Gamata Mari Muralia, my flute, Esura Gunte will play that tune, Jesur Tamane Gamata, the tune that you like. Again, my flute will play only the tune that you like. Our Hindu Shastras are a treasure chest of deep spirituality, sometimes symbolic and sometimes scientific as well. The number 108 is a very sacred number in Hinduism. It's the number of beads on any Mara that we turn while we're chanting God's name, but it's also extremely scientific. If you study science, or even Google it, if you take the diameter of the sun, which is approximately 1,390,000 kilometers, and divide that number by the diameter of the earth, which is about an average of 12,800 kilometers, then the number that you get is magically 108. Now, if you take the distance between the earth and the sun, and divide that number by the diameter of the sun, you also get 108. If you take the distance from the earth to the moon and divide that by the diameter of the moon, you also get close to 108. So this number 108 is spiritual, symbolic, and scientific. There is a Shiv Stotra of the 108 names of Shankar Bhagwan, even in the Swaminar and Sampraday, we have the Janmangal Namavali and Sajanan Namavali of the 108 names of Bhagwan Swaminar, explaining his Maima and glory. Basically, all avatars of Bhagwan have a list of 108 names in Hinduism. And the 108 names of Krishna Bhagwan is known as the Krishna Ashtottara Namavalihi, of which name number 86 is Venu Nad Visharad. Visharad means expert, and Venu Nad means the flute noise. So Venu Nad Visharad is Krishna Bhagwan, who is the expert of flute music. Thus, Krishna Bhagwan is also known famously as Murli Manohar and Mansidhar, which mean the same thing. Bhagwan is the master musician. Bhagwan is the virtuoso. In 2005, Pramukh Swami Maharaj was in Rajkot, a city in Gujarat, India, and one of the man managers of All India Radio 
the national broadcaster of all of India, had come to meet Swamiji. During their meeting, he praised Pramukh Swami Maharaj for the magnificent mandir in the city that he had constructed. And he asks Swamiji that how is it that you manage to do so much yet remain so stress-free, even without a trace of anxiety on your face? Swamiji humbly replies, Sir, I have not done anything. It is God who is doing everything. We are only an instrument like the instruments you play on your radio station. And God is the musician. God is the musician playing this instrument. He is in control. And remembering this keeps us forever happy and free of anxiety. So we see Pramukh Swami Maharaj is telling us exactly what the flute is teaching us. God is the musician and we are the instrument. We are His instrument. In order for us to be able to play sweet music, we must willingly surrender ourselves into the hands of God. This is the flexibility of the flute. Sometimes life doesn't always go according to our plan. So when things do go according to our plan, we should be happy. But when things don't go according to our plan, we should be happier. Yes, you heard correctly, happier. Because when things don't go according to our plan, this is the opportunity to realize that things may be going according to God's plan. And to be the happiest means to have no plan of our own at all, like the flute. The flute doesn't decide which song to play. The flute plays the song Krishna decides to play. So like the flute, we need to allow our life to move forward according to God's plan. And the reality is, we can't even plan out every moment of our life anyways. Life just happens. Don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan the things that we need to, but we have to gently, occasionally remind ourselves that life is okay the way it is, right now, really. Flexibility is knowing God has everything under control and God will do good. Flexibility is affirming that God has a plan for me and that plan is the best plan for me. Until the flute is in the hands of the musician, it's only as good as a simple piece of wood. Only once God begins to play it, does the piece of wood truly become a flute. We need to remind ourselves of the words of Pramukh Swami Maharaj. I am only an instrument and God is the musician. When we begin to feel the breath and spirit of God coursing through our veins, we become a new person. The moment we begin to feel God working through us is the moment our life takes on new meaning. Only then can we undergo a true transformation. The transformation is not being shaped from a piece of wood into a flute, but the transformation is going from being a flute sitting idly on a table to becoming filled with God's sweet music. When we become open enough and flexible enough to experience a God-filled reality in our life, our life automatically becomes a smooth, soothing, harmonious song. Our life becomes a musical. We've all experienced it. Even if we're just minding our own business, walking through the city or sitting on a bus, and we accidentally hear some music playing. Suddenly, we don't even remember when, unconsciously, we just start bobbing our head or tapping our feet, start singing along, or sometimes even dancing. So likewise, the flute being played by God carries the ability to create a smile upon the face of anyone who hears it. Similarly, when we generate the flexibility to allow ourselves to be filled with God's breath, we become happy and acquire the ability to make anyone who comes into our contact happy as well. 
We smile and that smile becomes contagious. We sing and others are inspired to sing and dance along with us. In 1976, Pramukh Swami Maharaj was in Amaravati, a village close to Nagpur, which is in the central part of India. Coincidentally, it was his birthday that weekend on December 7th. It was approaching. And one of the local organizations of Rotary, they had organized an assembly and invited Swamiji to grace the assembly. And it was on the same very day of his birthday, coincidentally. They had rented an auditorium. And when time came for the assembly, a grand total of three people showed up. And Stith Pragna Swami Shri went on to bless the assembly with a discourse as if the entire auditorium was jam-packed. Swamiji's ability to accept the unexpected and adjust to the situation is immeasurable. Now, most of our events for 2020 have been canceled. We might as well delete the calendar app from our phone while we're at it. But for those events that can't be canceled, and we may be holding virtually, currently, many of us are holding events without guests. We're doing the best we can. But it's even worse when you expect 300 people and only three show up. I'm sure we wouldn't put that on Instagram. In this situation of only three people showing up instead of 300, Swami Sri was able to keep himself, and not just himself, but everyone present in a good mood. So flexibility is accepting the unexpected, one. Second, flexibility is affirming God must have a plan in mind which I can't conceive or comprehend at the moment. And three, adjusting happily to whatever happens. And four, flexibility is adapting to make the most of the situation that is served to you. At home, flexibility is being able to get down on the floor and build a spaceship out of Lego with our son, even if it turns out to be multicolored with three wings, no wheels, and zero aerodynamic capabilities, and enjoying the moment nonetheless. Flexibility at home is sitting in the kitchen, on the kitchen table with our young daughter and sharing some crayons and drawing for the first time in our life and enjoying that and posting that picture onto the fridge. Flexibility at home is eating that meal that for whatever reason was not made to perfection without frowning with a smile on our face and genuinely praising that one part of that meal that is good. And flexibility at home is playing that board game with our family, even though you know you have other important work you have to finish off, but can be delayed for one more day. If we can't practice flexibility or being flexible with our own family members in this time, when will we ever practice learning flexibility at all? So flexibility is lowering our expectations from others and accepting others as they are, forgiving and spreading love to whoever we meet and praying for everyone in every way. This leads us to the third lesson of Krishna Bhagwan's flute. So far, Krishna's flute has taught us about fortitude and flexibility. And now the third lesson is one which we'll have to hear about in the next session. Till then, Jai Swaminarayan everyone, Namaste. We have a few questions. We'll look at one today. The question is, what should we do when someone, even a family member, doesn't cooperate with us? It's a very practical question. Cooperation is very important. Man Swami Maharaj displays the ideal situation and he says when it comes to relationships, we should cooperate at the expense of success, especially with family members and friends. Because the peace you feel from cooperating is greater than the temporary high 
you feel from an, an achievement of success. The sounds of applause will eventually fade. The trophy you get from, for achievement or winning something will collect us and be forgotten. The position that you get from the promotion is temporary and people only respect the position, not the person. But feelings of unity live forever. Feelings of humility and harmony and forgiveness and love, they live forever. So if you live with unity as a priority, then people will applaud you and respect you even if you don't hold the position of power anymore, even after it's taken away. We tend to think to ourselves, uh, I will only be happy or I will only keep unity if he keeps unity. I will only cooperate if she cooperates. I will only be flexible if he is flexible. But Yogi Ji Maharaj very often used to say, Je khai teni buk jai, which means the person who eats, their hunger will go away. In other words, whoever lives with this value of unity and tolerance and cooperation will benefit. We need to decide as an individual that this is something I want to do and that the benefit of doing so are spiritual, not just superficial. You feel peace within. We usually measure things upon appearance only from the outside. Whereas Yogi Ji Maharaj explains to us by defining greatness, he says, what is greatness? I will be happy when I don't look at anyone's negative side. The problem arises when we get it flipped backwards and we think to ourselves, I will be happy when no one looks at my negative side or my mistakes. So that's the personal commitment and conversation that we need to have with our mind. Then we need to decide this is something that I want to live by. I want to live according to this value of unity, tolerance, and cooperation. Then comes putting it into action during our interactions with other people. Even after we try to keep unity and the other person doesn't. Man Swami Maharaj explains to us very tersely, he says, do the best, leave the rest. Do the best you can and then leave the result to God. Krishna Bhagwan explains to Arjun, Karmani Eva Adikara Hate. You only have right or you only have control or you only have power to control what you can do. Your words, your actions, your thoughts. Ma Faleshu Kadachana. You don't have control over the fruits of your karma, the fruits of your action, or the result of your action. You can't control the outcome. So even after trying your best, you may not achieve success, but a larger part of karma is intention. And not every action alone on itself. We can't control other people. So do the best you can and leave the rest, the result in God's hand. That is the only way to be happy and have a peaceful, enjoyable life.